Acid rain is kind of a catch-all term, almost misleading really, in that uh, it could be rain, snow, sleet, fog, dry particles of dust, but it's really acidic precipitation from the sky. It's air pollution from mainly coal-fired power plants that uh, causes a change in the soil and water chemistry in the places where this pollution hits the ground. And we have this long history of this conservation model here in the Adirondacks. There's so much to learn. So a lot of people refer to this as a great experiment in conservation or something along those lines. The problem basically originates from uh, the burning of fossil fuels, uh, either from power plants or from automobiles. And these materials are released to the atmosphere, and there are two major pollutants associated with this that cause acid rain, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides. And these materials are transported in the atmosphere, and eventually they make their way to the land surface uh, days after they're emitted. So within the atmosphere they can be transported hundreds of miles from industrial areas such as the Ohio Valley area to relatively remote areas such as the Adirondacks. In the 1960s because of local ambient air quality problems in the Midwest the Environmental Protection Agency essentially advised the power companies to build very tall smokestacks. Now, when I say tall I'm talking 70 or 80 stories tall. That was enough to carry most of the heaviest pollution out of the local area. And Midwest thought it was a great idea because, hey, pollution is gone, right? Disappeared. Well, not quite. It did go away from the Midwest, but it landed a little farther away, a little farther east and a little farther north, and it continues to land in the Adirondacks. The Adirondacks are one place in the northeast where we really and I say we, and it's really a lot of other people that came before me, but um, learn the most about acid rain and its impacts. Because one of the reasons why the Adirondacks was focused on was because there was a lot of acid deposition falling here. But it's also because this is a relatively intact landscape, uh, forested watersheds. And so it gives us a barometer, a sense of what would, a, how something that was very a natural ecosystem, how would that respond to this change? Well, I'm Major Bowes. The Major is only a nickname. And uh, <clears throat> this is a small uh, resort hotel on Big Moose Lake, uh, which looks just the same as it did 60 years ago when uh, I first came. The acid rain, however, has affected uh, not only Big Moose, but a lot of the area. Not that you can see, you almost need a, to be a scientist to figure out what actually happened. It's actually difficult to observe uh, effects of acidity. It's, uh, it's chemicals, acids that are, that are dissolved in water, and uh, we can't see that. We can't see the, the materials that are in the, the water that we interact with or drink. For a while, ecosystems can handle pollution. They will adapt. Nature is very good at trying to balance out foreign influences. But over time, nature can't handle the kind of pollution that we were putting on the ground in the Adirondacks. I'm Dean Moulton. I work for the Town of Indian Lake. I'm the Water and Sewer Superintendent. I know it is, I know there is acid rain here because you can tell by the streaks that are on metal and on the dam in different places and the rocks. So I don't know what they do, what it does, but there's black flies here too. <laughs> Mostly the fish tell you 
uh, in the beginning, uh, the fishing was fair to Midland on Big Moose. And then after the acid rain and DDT for controlling black flies, it uh, went downhill. And up until uh, the last few years, we've had very little good fishing on Big Moose Lake. There are consumption advisories uh, for uh, fishing in the Adirondacks and uh, elsewhere. There's so much great water, uh, lakes, streams, rivers. Um, it, it's just covered with these beautiful waters. And uh, unfortunately, because of acid rain, many of these waters just don't have many fish in them. 200 years ago, you know, these streams and lakes were uh, full of uh, beautiful fish. And uh, now, um, really, the only place you're going to catch fish in the Adirondacks is where the state stocks them on a fairly frequent basis. <laughs> and that's uh, the unfortunate truth these days. Within the Adirondacks, there are about 3,000 lakes. And from big surveys that we did in the mid-'80s, we've seen that about a quarter of those lakes so somewhere on the order of 350, 400 uh, lakes are uh, acidic year round. Mercury is being broken out of compounds where it would normally remain idle and harmless forever. But instead, acidity breaks those compounds and causes inorganic mercury, which is harmless, to become organic mercury or methylated mercury. Once mercury is methylated, it is easily absorbed into animal tissue and gets into not only people's, people's bodies and, and organs, but uh, just as importantly, gets into the food chain. Sort of the connecting link in all this is calcium. Uh, calcium is an important nutrient for animals, obviously for humans. It's also very important for trees and for fish. Uh, really, the, the, one of the primary effects of acid rain is to leach so, uh, calcium out of the soil. The other uh, concern is aluminum. Uh, aluminum is a natural component of soil, but in the presence of acidity, it can become dissolved and get into soil water. And aluminum is very toxic to, uh, to trees and, uh, and other plants. We were constantly surprised at the variety of things that are damaged by acid rain. The state capitol, uh, literally stalactites of rock dripping off of the ornately carved facade of the building, it's barely 100 years old. Acidity certainly uh, deteriorates uh, surfaces of buildings and stone structures, so it's a significant problem in terms of material wear and tear. What we're looking at is the monitoring site, uh, the monitoring station um, that's been established here since 1983. And, and what you see is there's a large clearing here and this is to keep um, the instruments away from the vegetation from the trees because they can affect how they collect different types of data, whether it's wind speed data or temperature data, humidity, or the more sensitive collectors that are out here that, that measure the atmospheric and the precipitation chemistry. So the acid rain and the mercury and stuff. Every week we're coming in here and collecting the water samples, bottling them in sterile containers, shipping them out for analysis, getting getting the new stuff. And every week, you know, you know, 52 weeks a year. Uh, the samples, uh, when they come in from the field, uh, they need to be uh, prepared in a lot of different ways before we can analyze them, both the soils and the water. The soils get filtered in various ways. The soils have to be sieved. We're interested in how. The availability of calcium in the soils and in the vegetation shapes all of these different communities, going from little snails, little tiny snails and salamanders, which are very, very important critters. We're interested in going all the way up to looking at songbirds and even larger mammals, um, because we know how important of a nutrient it is. 
nitrogen as well as sulfur is an important part of acid rain and uh, when the nitrogen gets into the soil it gets changed by uh, bacteria and, and plants and so forth uh, so we need to be able to measure different types of nitrogen and, and uh, that's uh, what this instrument's used for. There's actually four collectors in here and each one of them feeds into a bottle like a funnel into a bottle. Um, what happens is we have this sensor here that's heated and whenever a raindrop or a snowflake melt, it falls on it and then melts, it will trigger this kind of contraption to open up. So it will collect the precipitation event. And then when it dries out again, this will actually come back and it'll close on top. We have had to spend some time going out into the Ohio Valley and persuading folks that, hey, uh, we're your neighbors to the Northeast. You've been throwing your garbage on us for the last 30 or 40 years. We'd really like you to stop now. And uh, here's, a picture of what it's been doing to us. Um, I found that people in the Midwest responded almost instantly to that and felt that they wanted to do something to fix that problem. I found that the power companies got bitter and resentful and accused us of being crackpots who didn't know what we were talking about. The activities that we do in everyday life are, are uh, potentially uh, causing harm. Uh, with the information we're gathering, um, you know, people, policymakers, uh, and so forth, uh, in the state and national level, can uh, then um, uh, take action to try to uh, uh, reduce pollution and, and uh, help protect these types of natural areas. We're almost at the fourth decade of research at Acid Rain here in the Adirondacks and here at Huntington Forest. And it's really remarkable because that work has gone directly into policy making. Like the science is a success story of science making its way into policy. We started here at home uh, with the state legislature. In 1984, we managed to persuade New York State to pass the first acid rain law in the country. We wanted to show that it was economically feasible to clean up air pollution. I think the average, the average citizen can continue to support, you know, environmental legislation um, that, that's reasonable and that's based on good science. So the Clean Air Act and the progress that we've made with respect to acid rain because of the Clean Air Act, I mean, that doesn't come about and that kind of policy doesn't have teeth, it doesn't work, unless people force their, their political leaders and the, their legislators and their representatives to, to care about this kind of stuff. The Clean Air Act amendments of 1990 were extremely important in that they were the first big step that Congress took to reduce pollution nationwide. What we've seen is a program that's reached its goals much quicker than, it, uh, than Congress ever expected it to, and quicker than the deadlines that were set up by Congress under the plan. Although it's relatively easy to point the finger at power plants, uh, the bottom line is it's really uh, involved in energy consumption and the types of energy choices that we that we make. Invest with some green, you know, concepts in mind. Um, try to buy products that are renewable. Try to buy things that are recycled. Try to buy things that don't contribute to the actual smokestack. If people can turn down the thermostat in the winter time, they can turn down the lights in the uh, all year long. They can do their best to conserve electricity and find alternative ways of generating it, uh, I think that's, uh, that's all going to help with the acid rain problem. All that we do really has to be a matter of building momentum through public education. Ultimately, the Adirondacks will be healthier a generation from now than they are right now. And if that's the only legacy I leave as a human being, well, I think I've done pretty well. It's just a spectacular place to hike up there and the clouds come in and um, it's almost an emotional experience uh, to see um, the environment uh, and how it's ever-changing. For me this is a special place not only ecologically but it's it's special in terms of the fulfillment it gives me you know spiritually and to be in New York State and and to have a landscape like this um, I'm you know I I went into this line of work because I like to walk around in the woods. So, I mean, that's, it's kind of simple for me.
lost my heart to Caroline And I worked ten days in the Mississippi Delta Laying tar in the sun so hot it melted When they gave me my pay, Lord, to get to town By your queen I had to find me A drunkest dream if I ever did see one Stranger is a friend with a memory land, and my mama said poetry is nonsense. And I'm just trying to make my mark across this yellow sky before my name fades into the dark. 